All right, MC8, welcome back. What's cracking? Kicked up some dust last time. A little bit. A little bit. About to do it again here. Yes, sir. So first and foremost, which way is west? Yeah. This is your first solo album in 10 years? Yeah, that's about right. About 10 years, yeah. All right, so let's talk about it. Number one, why that? Uh, why the title? Uh, basically, man, I just wanted to get back to, you know, I felt like, you know, with my opinion, uh, West Coast music was, you know, it was wide open. Everybody was doing everything. And I think like for fans and people across the board, they were, you know, missing the sound of the old, you know, nothing but a G thing feel or, you know, you know, once upon a time in the projects feel or boys in the hood feel or, right. you know, drive by Miss Daisy feel, you know, like, so I just felt that I wanted to address that by saying which way is West to get back to letting people know, like, some people might have lost the identity of West Coast music. So I wanted to direct it back to, you know, do people know what the West is. Right, because you actually had an interesting quote. You said, well, for a minute it seemed like all our West Coast veterans were trying to do what everybody else was doing to stay relevant. I understand you got to adapt to the times, but I felt people weren't giving a damn about the originality of the West Coast music. Well, I just felt like, you know, not to try to signal out, but I just felt like, you know, we were trying to do stuff that everybody else was doing to, you know, adapt to the times, you know, and I'm just one of those people that feel like, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know, you got to let people know what the foundation of what we brought to the table was. And if we're doing everything else that other rap artists or states or coast are doing, then it kind of loses our identity as far as, you know, veteran cats like Toddy T or Mixmaster Spade mm. or Easy or dudes like that who were in the, in the, in the streets with it who gave us an, our identity with West Coast music. And to just forget about that, I thought was kind of fucked up. Well, because I just interviewed Too Short. Right, and you were the only rappers in Oakland. There was nothing going on outside of us as far as hip hop. When we started that hustle, and we were doing that, we were the rappers. There yeah. was nobody else. People probably were in the house getting ready to, to appear or something, you know, the, I mean, you talk to guys like E-40. I mean, motherfuckers was trying to get a hold of a Freddie B. Too Short tape. That was something that, man, I got one. <laughs> Copy that shit for me, something. I got to have that. Yeah. For real. Oh, I mean, hip-hop, I mean, if you want to go back to early days of, 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 of Southern California music, and then Short was from Southern California. Originally, yeah, he was yeah, from so. South Central. But he moved I, to Oakland right. as a kid. So, I, I, I mean, in the early days of West Coast music, I mean, if you were here, it was Egyptian Lover and Uncle Jam's Army. Was and, there anyone before them? No. That's it? That No. Egyptian Lover. Egyptian, to, I remember as far as West Coast rap starting, I remember Egyptian Lover. I remember Uncle Jam's Army. I remember... Uh, uh, um, uh, Bobby Jimmy and the Critters, you know. Right. I remember that type of shit. We didn't have the the Run DMC. We did. We had L.A. Dream Team. We had uh, Unknown DJ and the Wrecking Crew. You yeah. know that was our sound. But then we had underground heroes like Toddy T and Mixmaster Spade and DJ Pooh and those cats who were making TDK tapes. So our er, to me, our early our early hip hop was electronic, electro you know, electric kingdom, yeah. you know, that type it's of Twilight shit. Twilight 22. Yeah, I love exactly. that. Exactly. I love that. I did too, because that was yeah. our sound, you know. Yeah. Mix records, it's time and shit like that, you know, that yeah. was our foundation to me of West Coast music. We didn't have the treacherous threes and the Grandmaster Flashes. We, we didn't have that. So 
To me, our foundation really started with cats like Toddy T, Mixmaster Spade, and Easy came along, and, and, and those dudes set forth the foundation of what was really going on because we started with the storytelling in music as far as the one times and on the block and trying to sell dope. So that's right. what my early transition of. And then you got cats like Young MC who came and then Tone well, Loke. Well, you got Ice-T. Ice-T had, Ice-T was hip hop to me. Dog in the wax, you don't quit, you know, but he still to me was more street than just hip hop because his element was street. And then when he came with six in the morning, it just took it to a whole different side. Yeah. And like I said, we used to bump uh, Schooly D over here because that resonated with us, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. to me, that was our music. You know, we were getting away from that. I feel you. Now, you wanted to do a real West Coast album, but you do it with DJ Premier. <laughs> I the... went to DJ Premier because <laughs> Premier is the cat who I've been friends with and he was the one who came to the table and, and offered to help me put my record out. I wasn't getting that from nobody else. Okay. So that's why I went to, so it wasn't a, okay, I'm a, I'm a call my record which way is west, but I'm gonna go do it with an East Coast producer. Right. Me and, me and Primo is friends. So it was on that aspect of he liked what I was doing, so he like, let's put a record out on you. You know, fuck the rest of the bullshit. You know, you a legend, you an icon, you deserve it. So we just went from there. And he never wanted to take away from the direction of it being a West Coast record. You know, of course, Primo is Primo. He can produce whatever. But it, it specifically, I wanted those type of beats from him to show the versatility of, when people go, which way is West? Oh, it's just gonna be about West Coast, West Coast. But then I wanted those type of beats from Premier so people can see that it was about the lyrics too. Right. Not just using him as a figure, you know what I'm saying? Well, Premier is not just a East Coast producer. Exactly. He is, he is like the East Coast producer. Yeah. If you were to actually, let's just, let's just keep it all the way 100. Like, if you were to pick one producer to epitomize the East Coast sound as a whole, Premier is the only name that I could honestly say would go head and shoulders above everyone else. Exactly. No disrespect to Marley Marl, no disrespect to, you know, a lot of other producers out there, legendary East Coast dudes, but Premier was the East Coast gritty sample, you know, hear the yeah, clicks he, loop, like one loop, that goes all the way through, no switch ups. Exactly. This is the best shit I, I can make, and you're gonna keep hearing this for the entire song, and it's gonna work, and you're gonna love it. Definitely. I mean, I've always had respect for Primo's production. Like I said, I don't just look at him as a East Coast producer. To me, he worldwide. Primo's everywhere, man. And like I said, he done does stuff for me. He's done stuff to his to NYGs, to his singer Tory Wolf to Christina Aguilera, to Biggie, to Jay-Z, to not so. Everybody. He's a cat that has his hands in everything. So when I first went, when we first got together of doing the project and him being executive producers, because I respected him for that. You know what I'm saying? Not just me and him being homies, but he's DJ Premier. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Real talk. Absolutely. Who else is on this record? Oh man, we got Rage on the record, Be Real's on the record, Corrupt, Exhibit, Melee, Dub C, Bumpy Knuckles, Big Mike, uh, CMW. Um, I just basically went out to dudes that I felt I respected and respected me in the same type of aspect and then some cats that I've worked with already just to keep the 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 difficulty of trying to put together a project together and trying to run out and grab everybody and who, what, wherever. So, you know, me and Primo just reached out to dudes we had respect for and we feel had respect for us. And once we called them and say, you know, can y'all get down? It was like a no brainer. So I tried to stick to, to, to simplicity with this record. You know what I'm saying? You have two songs with DJ Quick. Yeah. Now, last time we talked, on straight checking them, I had a song called Death Wish. Okay. Never knew who Quick was. 
but apparently his home or whatever, I don't know. I ain't, I'm, don't quote me on this. I don't know how I got back to him. I had a song called Death Wish. In the song, it had a verse that said, biting me quick would mean you get my dick sucked quick. People took that to say I was dissing quick. Interesting. Okay. I never knew him. I, I, it was just a phrase to me. Then I did straight checking him, which had the line biting me quick in it. So I guess from the demo tape to that line, uh, it got misconstrued. He, he thought that was a reply to his shit. There you go. Okay. That's how the beef got started to me. Snoop had to go do an interview for BET. And they asked me to come, and they said Quick was going to be there. So I took it upon myself, said, fuck it. I went to the interview. He was there. We talked about it, you know, whatever, whatever. It wasn't no beefs, whatever. And then I think that night I went over to the studio with him and Mossberg. Mm. And Rest in peace. Yeah. I went over to the studio with him and Mossberg because he was working on the uh, I think he was trying to do a soundtrack for the Freeway Rick movie that they did straight to DVD. Mm -hmm. And I went over there and we worked on a song or something. It never came out. But I think after that, you know, we, we had no more in our corners. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He was his own man. I was my own man. No, it nothing serious like between we never came to fist blows or gunshots. So I think just as grown men, we were able to go, you know, I'm something. What led up to you guys actually working together on this album? Uh, I mean, shit, uh, we were doing shows, you know, I think I did uh, Crush Groove once or twice. He was on the bills, too. You know, we would chat then and then. Uh, I knew people who were working with Problem. So um, basically Problem reached out to me and said that he wanted me to get on a song with him. So, you know, my people hollered at him and said, yeah, no problem, whatever. So I basically went up to the studio and Quick was there. And uh, we got in the studio and we chatted and talked and they told me about the project. They had already released the EP of Rosecrans, so uh, that's when Quick said he was, they was about to turn it into a full album and they had this idea of the songs. So we talked, we smoked, we drank, and uh, he played me the beats and I instantly jumped on them right then and there. I mean, Quick is a musical genius. Oh, he got, he got, he got production. Like I said, you have some cats that just got their foot in it when it comes to producing music. So you just have to, you have to just give props to that period outside of other, all the other bullshit we might've had in the past or whatever. But you know, when people got talent, they just got talent, you know, and with me just, you know, always being inclined on rapping and telling stories and just really want to give my all when it comes to lyrics. I just think it just worked. You know what I'm saying? He's he's a he's a hell of a beat maker. And when it comes to me and storytellings and trying to tell stories about the neighborhood and where we come from, both of us from Compton, mm -hmm. it was just a good pairing, you know, and I think that's why the songs came out pretty good, because it was something that people were anticipating for a long time that we never got to really put into fruitation. And it was just one of them days, you know, shit, I wasn't doing nothing, fuck it. I'm gonna go to the studio. We got there, he was there, problem was there. They was barbecuing and drinking champagne and we was smoking and it turned out to be a good night. So I ended up getting on two songs. I don't think a lot of the young kids realize how big of a deal this is for LA hip hop to have MC8 and DJ Quick doing songs together. Man, it's, I know it's something probably people probably figured never would happen because of what the beef and whatever, but like I said, we grew up in, and we just figured that representing Compton and trying to uplift West Coast music would be better than beefing or whatever, and you know, 
everything, music is music, man. You know, you go through transitions. We've seen LL Cool J and Kumo D. We've seen Cube and Lynch Mob with Easy and them. So raps has had, rap has had its beefs, you know what I'm saying? Whether it's been good or bad for hip hop, but I think with us try, doing this song is big because of how the beef, whatever it was, and it was so significant for a long time. And then like, with the youth today, you know, a lot of them don't signify with our type of music. So it's only certain cats in like our generation who understand the 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 structure and, and I guess how big me and him getting on the song and then it ended up being two songs, not just one. So but with the younger the younger generation, you know, they into that other shit right now. So it's kind of hard for them to fathom the fact that MC8 and DJ Quick, you know, two motherfuckers who had like neighborhood street beef, you know, to come together and get on the records. But that's what you have to do sometimes. You got to learn how to adapt and grow up. So, how do the neighborhoods feel about it? Shit, motherfuckers ain't tripping off shit like that. Motherfuckers like Rep Compton and make music, right. you know what but I'm I mean, saying? But I mean, are they happy about it? Is, is it? I don't get any negative feedback from shit like that because I don't indulge myself. Like, I mean, I fuck yeah. with the homies from the neighborhood when it's on the aspect of, you know, everybody trying to get into the music game now and do something positive. So, I mean, shit, my homies from the neighborhood is fucking with Slim 400, you know, so. I got a young homie right now named Park Bo who's doing his, run, his rap thing and he's getting out there networking in circles. He just shot a video with Slim 400. So niggas are beyond that shit, you know, yeah. when they can see that it's something greater. You get me? I hadn't heard from you in a while, and then you popped up on Kendrick's first album, mm -hmm. which I thought was, was big. And it works so well. The way, the way that song is put together and the way you do the chorus is just so, so ill. So can you talk about what led up to that actually happening? Um, I've been coaching, you know, football, my son and stuff. And then uh, actually my son's daughter, my son's sister hit me up and said that she knew them. And they basically reached out to her and asked her, could she contact me? So she called me and said, yeah, this guy named Kendrick wants to do a song with you. And I was like, okay. So I looked him up. That's when I found out, you know, he was messing with Dre and they was getting ready to put the record out and whatever. So I was like, yeah, no problem. But then sometimes, you know, you get, I get that all the time. Niggas want to do songs, niggas want to go on the road, niggas want to do this, and you look up a year later, you ain't heard from a motherfucker. So I'm used to that. So when he said it, I was like, yeah, it's cool, holler at me. So I had totally forgot about it. And like two, three weeks later, he hit me and told me to come to the studio. So I went to the studio, and as soon as I got there, he sat me down, told me the direction of what he wanted to do, how he wanted the song to go, what he wanted the hook to say, what he wanted me to say on the hook, the streets he wanted me to name, all that. So for a cat who was, you know, just getting into this shit, he was already there with it. Like he knew how he wanted his songs laid out, the direction of it, the music, you know, all that. The breakdown from going from Mad City to that song, and it, it, it was all laid out in his vision. So I thought that was pretty big for a cat like that who people were just now starting to gravitate to from the Section 80 record he had did mm -hmm. to hooking up with Dre. And now I, I just thought it was, it was simple for me to just go in because first of all, the bird in the hand beat was, you know, that's just fucking, you fucked that up anyway. So. When I heard the beating, I'm like, oh, that's that old school cube right there. So it was just natural shit. And then he wanted me to talk about shit that I had already been, already been talking about for years. So it was it was it was simple to me. I think I know I know people when they hear songs, they think it's like kind of hard to come up with the concepts and and whatever. But when shit is on, it's just on, and that's just how I work. Okay, so because you know everyone talks about Section 80 these days, but 
when it came out, I, I never heard of it. I, I didn't, didn't either. Yeah, I, I didn't know about Kendrick until. The and I can be honest with you, I didn't even know about Kendrick. Yeah. I had no idea who Kendrick Lamar was until he called me. And that's when I started doing my research. And then I was like, he from Compton. They just signed the Aftermath with Dre through Top Dog. And then, you know, so I. I was I was I was in the dark just like a lot of cats was. And then when he was, you know, a lot of cats were like, you know, he was on he was sort of conscious with it. He wasn't like gangster. Right. You yeah. know, but he still had the subjects of knowing how to put that out there about growing up in the hood and seeing my cousins or my brother shot and the police and going to, but then he could still take you th- down another road of consciousness. So I, I I just thought he was a I thought he was good for hip hop and as far as Compton is concerned, I mean, anybody represent the city is good to me. Okay, so you came in and he already had the chorus pretty much. Yeah, all that shit laid out. Oh, so you pretty much just did the I vocals. I went and wrote my verse and the chorus and all that. The Rosecrans, Alondra, Bullets, all he had all that shit laid out. Crazy. All that he he like. I want you to say Alondra. I want you to say Cluckheads on the block. I want you to say you know. And then I ad lib some shit on my own. But he basically, this is what I want you to say on it. And to me, that was cool because I didn't have to come up with shit. Right. Like fuck it, you already know what you want me to say. <laughs> fuck, I'm cool with that. Now I ain't got to write. Now I ain't got to think about a hook or a chorus or nothing because I don't like doing that shit anyway. Okay. Just let me write this, write my verse and get the fuck on out. So you put it together. When it was done, were you like, oh, this is about to be some shit? Man, I, I didn't look at it like that because I, I look at shit like you do it, you do it. Now, it, I looked at it like, okay, he got Dre behind him, so it's going to be a good record. But... When I do songs, I look at them like we too we too grimy and hard for motherfuckers to just it's gonna be one of those songs. You know what I'm saying? Like when I did Straight Up Menace, I wasn't looking for it to be no song like that. It was just a song I wrote because I'm talking about shit that regularly goes on. And then with being in the movie, so I didn't look at it like, oh man, Mad City is finna be large and motherfuckers is finna be, you know, and you look up five years later, it's gonna have 60 million thousand views and shit and like that. So I, 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 don't, I don't look at shit like that when I do it. I put out music to, to please myself and niggas that I know like this type of shit. Do I go, oh man, this is finna be an international fucking Christina Aguilera, Lady Gaga ass type of shit. No, I don't look at songs like that. I put them out there. If they go, good. If they just please the niggas that I know, then I'm good on that too. I don't look for that superstardom type of shit. Sure. But when the album came out and it started to go kind of superstardom, how'd you feel being part of it? Shit, I'm, 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 man, I'm, I'm a humble nigga. I'm simple. I didn't go, oh man, my fucking Kendrick record is. I'm, I'm, I'm simple, man. Fuck it. I'm like, oh yeah, it's banging. Good looking, my nigga. Cool. Good looking. Yeah. People like, oh no, nigga, that shit is fire. And I'm still like, good looking. You know, right. I, I'm. I don't get excited like that, man. Shit, I've been doing this shit for so fucking long. It's like waking up putting on my motherfucking uniform, punching the clock, you go to work, you know what I'm saying? So I just try to do the best at my job, fuck it. Feel you. Um, Now, you were supposed to be in the Kendrick All Right video? Yes. (laughs) What happened there? I had a show out of town, and um, they called me all weekend to come do it. They wanted me to be in the part where him and What's his name? Tony Cruz is in the car and they doing the menace scene and then they go inside the club and they do all. They wanted me to do that and I tried to make it, but I had a show Friday night. They wanted to shoot the video that Friday, but I had a show. So they pushed it back to Saturday, but by the time I landed, I was head coach of a football team. My game was starting. Mm. So I. It didn't happen. I wanted to do it bad, but 
I couldn't let down the kids, you know. I yeah. couldn't see myself going to be in a video and then have my squad out there with the assistant. Like, I didn't sign up for that. When I signed up the head coach, it was it was the whole way. So no disrespect to my nigga. I called him. I told him, you know, I appreciate it. Thank you for considering me, but I couldn't make it because of the boys. So that's dope, man. That's a great reason to miss it. Miss that, like that's it. Any other reason, I'd have yeah. been there. But and then especially my son plays too, and I'm right. the coach. So <laughs> the kids is like, you know, they probably would have told me too. Fuck that, coach. Go to the video, but. I I'm I, 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 I made a commitment to them and that's why I try to teach my son. When you start something, you finish it. You know what I'm saying? This kind of reminds me a little bit of this other story that just broke uh, earlier this month. Um, the golfer Phil Mickelson, mm. one of the top one of the top yeah, golfers. I, I heard of Phil Mickelson. He missed the U.S. Open because of his daughter's high school graduation. I mean, I can understand that. I mean. In some ways I can, some ways I can't. You know you don't want to miss that paycheck because that's for the kids too and whatever, but it's just sometimes, th this is a saying I tell people, all money ain't good money, mm -hmm. okay? And what I mean by that is, yeah, money is good, but at the price of what you gotta sacrifice to get that dollar, sometimes you gotta bypass that. And I look at it like, when I first started rapping and touring, I didn't pass up shit. So I didn't see my daughters do nothing mm. because every fucking weekend I didn't give a shit. Money, show, let's go. Overseas, let's go. It wasn't like, oh, my daughter got a cheerlead match this weekend. Fuck that. We got to go get paid. The more I did that and they grew up, it's like you want to have that with your kids in any type of fucking business you do. So I just started learning how to just sacrifice the shit. Fuck it. Yeah, I want to go make that money, but then my son throw a fucking 30-yard pa touchdown pass and I don't get to see that, I'm going to be fucking disappointed too. So I just had to start balancing shit. Okay, I can come do the show if you can get me back the next day by 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. Then I come. If you can't, then we gotta push it. So I just learned to start sacrifice because sometimes you gotta do that. You know? I feel you. You know, Kendrick's you know just dropped that damn album, which was right. a beast, a beast. Um, you know, people are talking about whether they like that better than Good Kid, Mad City. I think it's a bit of a toss up. I definitely like it better than you know, uh, Pimp a Butterfly. Pimp a Butterfly, which I thought. Which, well, yeah, I I like uh, I like Ma I like Mad City more than the Pimp a Butterfly. Yeah, I like damn more than to pimp a butterfly. Yeah, but I liked it pimp a butter. It had certain songs like "All Right" was good. Um, yeah, it was a few. It was uh, some uh, "Black of the Berry" was good. That was, was good. Yeah. It was another one on there too. Uh, what's the other one he did about the pussy? What's the name of that one? God damn, what is the name of that song? These walls. Yes, these, these walls? walls is pretty good too. Yeah. But I, I think, uh, damn, it just, I think that kind of picked up real hard because of what was going on in the music business, you know what I'm saying? And for him to come back, for him to be one of those forefront big cats right now, and for him to tell people like, you know, it ain't all about the big cars and the jewelry and the money and the bitches with the fake this and fake that and everybody trying to be somebody else. I think that kind of resonated home with a lot of people who are normal motherfuckers. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's why the success of Damn did better than Pimper Butterfly because even though they all good, and like I said, my nigga doing numbers like it ain't shit. So, right. but it's just certain songs resonate with certain groups of type of people. And when you can grab those normal motherfuckers, then you winning, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Were you close to Prodigy? I knew Prodigy, we've done stuff together. I wasn't real close to him, but I was, let's say I was industry close. Okay, I know exactly what you mean. It always shakes me up when someone younger than me dies. True. You know what I mean? And you know, especially people that I've dealt with. I've interviewed Prodigy a few on a few occasions. You know, we see each other say what's up, you know, industry clothes, exactly. like you said. You know, like we've done projects, you know, exactly. the interviews, like how you probably done songs. Um 
And, you know, I've heard that he was sick for a while. Right. You know, with the sickle cell and everything exactly. else like that. But to suddenly die at 42 is... Yeah, I think it kind of it kind of makes you realize that, like, you know, we get up every day. We live. We do simple shit. You know, we come here. We do this. Get in our car, drive, go get a cup of coffee, some water or whatever. And I think when something like that happens in our community of this rap shit, because let's face it, if he was just another normal nigga and died at 42, it'd be like another motherfucker died, you know, whatever, had a heart attack, whatever, so whatever. But because it's our hip hop community and we are so close knit with motherfuckers, with each other, I think like it hits home to us like, damn, he didn't get shot in a drive by or, he wasn't selling dope or got caught up in some beef bullshit. Like, my nigga just died. I think that just, it, it kind of hits home to niggas that realize, like, shit. Like, ain't shit, ain't shit promised. You know what I'm saying? Because you can be right here with a motherfucker today making a song, and tomorrow you hear on the news, they done OD'd or they done died in their sleep or, you know. So I, I think that kind of hit home to a lot of people in the rap community because he was still a stellar artist. You know what I'm saying? He was still a motherfucker going out on the road, doing shows, doing interviews and shit like that. So for him to pass like that, and then like you said, it wasn't a case of, well damn, you know, he was sick for the past three months or everybody knew he had sickle cell and was fighting right. it, but he was fighting it. Right. So, so it, it was kind of a shock when Primo called me and was like, Prodigy just died. Yeah. I was like, wow. Right, I mean, he was on tour with Ice-T, right? They just did the, yeah, he did the, he got sick when they did their last show in Vegas. And uh, from what I heard, you know, cause Alk is on tour with him, Alchemist. Mm -hmm. From what I heard, he, he, he didn't feel good after his last show. And they took him to the hospital and something about, he started choking. Right. There was there was a story that he choked on an egg. egg. I heard that story too. Yeah, and I actually checked with TMZ on this because we had put it up and people were just murdering us in the comments. And because because what had happened was they couldn't exactly prove he died from the egg. Exactly. So the way it was presented was the he was in the hospital and he just he choked on an egg which had nothing to do with his death, but it, it kind of did from what, right. I, from what I was told is that he has choked on the egg, but they haven't really done the autopsy exactly. yet. Exactly. From, from what I was told, it wasn't, I wasn't told the egg thing, but I was told he started choking. Okay, so you heard that from the inside camp. Yes, I heard okay. from the inside camp that he started choking. That's it why he started choking or from what or what i didn't go on that level but i just heard he started choking yeah and then from the choking i guess maybe someone wasn't there to right clear or his exactly his, his airway or whatever yeah. and it just closed up right and sickle cell i guess what you have seizures from it Sickle cells, you can have seizure, you can get dehydrated, and that's what it was. He was performing so much that it kicked in because it was fucking 112, 115 yeah. at night when they was performing. So it kicked up his dehydration, and that's how he got sick. Yeah. Sad, man. One now, of the... it's, 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 it's fucked up to lose somebody that a lot, like I said, P had a lot of respect from a lot of his peers in this music business. So it's like every, it, 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 it resonate hard when you lose somebody like that who is significant in hip, cause Mob Deep was significant in Very much so. You know what I'm very, saying? Very, very much so. Like so many classic songs. Exactly. I mean, shit, I played Mob Deep. And not just on the fact of just the, uh, oh yeah, it's another, you know, I listened to Mob Deep, so. Right, and I think that they were sort of responsible for kind of igniting East Coast gangster music. I, I could you say know? that. I could say that they were more, they were more hoodie yeah. than your typical 
East Coast, you know, LL, Eric B and Rakim, EPMD, yeah. Tribe Car Quest. Yeah, totally different. They were, yeah. Totally they different. They were totally different. When I heard rock you in your face, stab your brain with your nose bone, the, the imagery was something that I hadn't really seen, or I mean, heard before. It was like, no one was saying shit like that. No, they 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 brought out that, that, that like you want to say, that hood shit yeah. from the New York cats, you know. Like I said, niggas in New York was always hard, you know, went to projects, the boroughs, whatever, but those were the first cats to me who identified, like you said, with gangster shit. Like yeah. they were, they had gangster music coming from East Coast niggas. That's right. what I looked at with Mob Deep. Yeah, no, they put you in the Queensbridge project. Exactly. Like you, you really were right there with them. Exactly. Like I said, no disrespect to other niggas. Like we know niggas have they they hood tales, but yeah, they reminded you of some gangster niggas, some East Coast gangster niggas. And the thing about Prodigy and I. And, I didn't know him that well. Like I said, we just did a few interviews here and there. We'd run into each other. But based on what I saw on TV and then hanging out with him, and I don't know him well enough to say this, but I'm just going to go ahead and guess. It seems like with his, his health situation, he was never really happy and smiling and, and joking. There always was sort of like this aura of sadness around him. And I don't know whether that was dealing with the health issues or not. I mean, some people just put on that guard because you don't know what to expect from this business. And this business will fuck you up. It'll make you hard. It'll make you cold if you don't know how to set yourself aside from shit that's not working. You know what I'm saying? And that's what you have to learn because it'll give you a, this motherfucking shit will give you that attitude like, Man, fuck everybody, and then you know everything is cold, so your music is cold, everything is about fuck this and fuck that and shoot them up this and, you know, so this music, this this game can run you down hard to where you can't put a smile on because ain't shit to smile about, it. especially if you've been in this motherfucker for 20 years trying to eat and you still climbing that motherfucking ladder, you know what I'm saying? Right, because I remember at one point where, you know, I was kind of hanging around with them dudes a little bit and this was before he went to jail. You know, he had the bulletproof, like, Suburban, mm -hmm. like, for real. Yeah. Like, he was really, that was his everyday car. He rolled around every day in a bulletproof fucking car. You know, that, that says a lot right there. That's just the nature of the beast of when you, like I said, when motherfuckers say, think you start making records, they think your lifestyle changes from what, whatever, but it don't. You just making records. That don't have shit to do with the motherfuckers that's still across the street who don't give a fuck. Or the right. niggas around the corner who don't give a fuck. You might be trying to live your life differently, but them cat they don't give a damn. Don't yeah. give a fuck if that nigga is rap master this or top billing that or whatever. I'm, I'm gonna smoke that nigga when I get a chance. And you still have that. So like I said, this game will, will put you in that situation to where you gotta live hard. You know what I'm saying? Right. And you can't put a smile on because the niggas will take that for granted and think, oh yeah, nigga, this nigga always joking and smiling and shit. We gonna stick this nigga. So you right. have to watch yourself in this game because it's just like the streets. It is the streets well, really. And then, you know, not only is he rolling around with a bulletproof car, but then he gets caught with a gun. And in New York, there's like a zero. Oh tolerance yeah, New, of that. New York is zero. Man, I used to hate. I used to hate to go to New York and be strapped or have some 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 weed or anything. Cause <laughs> man, them motherfuckers, boy, they do not be playing. Yep, absolutely not. Rockefeller laws ain't no joke. Jay Z shouted you out. Yeah, I saw that. You and like 50 other people. Right. But, but shit, I'm on the list. So you're on the it. list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Coming from Jay, you know what I'm saying? That shit don't happen. You know what I'm saying? So Right. I'm sure a lot of people's feelings were hurt for not getting mentioned that I'm day. I'm pretty sure, too, <laughs> shit. Because I was surprised. I'm like, I'm on that list? Okay. Well, shit, that's pretty good. But, you know, I came from that era. Uh, I used to listen to jazz. You know, you know, I used to listen to jazz. Old, jazz old, yeah. We used to be on EMI together. So oh, okay. that's how I knew about jazz and Jay-Z when he first came out with Hawaiian Sophie and all mm -hmm. 
because we were label mates. So I used to pick up all that shit. I used to love Jazz's shit and Jay's first shit, you know. That's me. I just like music, you know what I'm saying? But that I thought that was pretty big. So did a lot of people. So did Primo. So, you know, just to be respected, you know what I'm saying? Because, like, it's a thousand of us in this game. It's a billion of us now in this rap game, you know, so to be signified by one of the dudes who's looked at as, you know, that nigga, and to be signaled out as being one of the motherfuckers that influenced his whatever today, I mean, that's pretty big, so you gotta respect that. Okay, so you were label mates with Jazzo. Yeah. But Jay was not on that label. No. I think Jay had just did the song with him, the yeah. Hawa- Hawaiian Sophie. Well, he did Hawaiian Sophie, then he did Originators. Right. But he wasn't signed to EMI. Yeah. We were signed through EMI through Orpheus. Okay. So that's how we were labeled. Man, I don't know what label Jazz was on, but everything was up under the EMI umbrella. Did you have a relationship with Jay at all? No. Never met him? I've met him. Met I've him. talked to Jay a few okay. times in the clubs and stuff like that. It's, it's nothing but respect. I mean, you know, I respect a nigga like that because he, he, shit, nigga paid, you know what I'm saying, with this rap shit. And he, he took that shit from the streets and just made it into this big ass shit it is. So you can't do nothing but respect a motherfucker like that, just like with Dre. Right. Well, I think what's, what's so special about Jay is that, okay, yeah, he's, he's rich and Rock Nation is a big entity and... You know, he's got his hands on a lot of different stuff. That's cool. But when he drops an album, it's highly anticipated. Of course. You see what I'm saying? Whereas, like, you know, other artists, people respect them, but they drop an album and it's like, okay, oh, he dropped an album last month? Okay, I'll go check it out when I have a minute. Like, people anticipate a J album like they anticipate, like, a Drake album or a Kendrick album. You see what I'm saying? Exactly. And he's what, fifty years old? I guess. I mean, that's point? that's just from having a, a a constant track record of good mm. shit. I mean, just hands down. I mean, I mean, shit. Since fucking fucking since reasonable doubt. I mean, every record is is been on point. Right. So, I mean, at this point, all twelve of his albums have gone platinum. Exactly. So, I mean, you have to look at that. You know, that's just like I look at Cube like that. You know what I'm saying? I look at Ice Cube like that to the fact that my nigga Cube has that worldwide respect that when he does a movie, when he does whatever, people anticipate. Jay-Z is just one of them niggas who've never let you down when it comes to that shit you want to hear. Right. But to be fair, and this is not a shot at Ice Cube, but people are not looking forward to an Ice Cube album these days the way they're looking forward to a Jay-Z album. No, but people look forward to an Ice Cube show. People look forward to an Ice Cube movie. So I don't downplay it on the act because like I said, it's two different things. Jay made his mark with music and all that. Cube went through movies and all that. So yeah. I just I just look at it as a different aspect. Cause to me, I I anticipate a Cube album all day. Well yeah. But for the fans, the fans, you know, the fans look at it like it's an all entity. Like Jay is out there. Well, but but here's the thing. I would say, from my personal, uh, you know, preference, mm-hmm. I would say, at their heights, I liked Ice Cube better than Jay Z. Oh, definitely. And that might be me being from the West Coast. I don't know, but Ice Cube at his prime. I felt was a better rapper than Jay Z at his prime. I, I I could I could say that. I mean, not to be disrespectful, but I could say like I mean, nothing of course, disrespectful about it. It's I could say opinion. that I, I I could because Cube was that lyrical nigga. I yeah. mean, Jay is nice with his shit too. Mm-hmm. Jay gonna tell you, no, I flipped that, I flipped it, and did that, and I copped that, and I did. Cube back in his prime was like, he was that soldier, you know what I'm saying, for the street music, I felt. Because even though Cube would lead you down the streets, Cube was like political. Cube was fucking America, fuck that, you know, in the streets, fuck that, and this is what happened. So, and I think because of the situations of, of, 
You know, if you came from straight hard up and trying to and get yours in the street as far as being a, a hustler, making money, it's always going to be different. You know what I'm saying? Compared to the baller niggas on the block and the niggas who selling the 20 rocks. You know what I'm saying? Somebody life is always going to be harder and it's always going to be more expressive. And I think that's what Cube had. I feel you. So... You didn't see the Tupac film. No. But originally, me and you got hooked up through Scarface. Right. You and Scarface, I assume, were close. Yeah, me and Scarface, are, we, that's my boy to this day. Yeah, I, I fuck with Scarface. That's one of the few people in, in hip-hop that yeah, I, I have like, a lot of respect like for. I got we, friends in hip-hop, and then yeah. I got, uh, you know, business motherfuckers. Right. Scarface is one of my friends. Yeah, me and Scarface, we have conversations that have nothing to do with exactly. any, any business whatsoever. Right, like, like yeah, yeah, me and Scarface talk about football, just like with Dub, you know. It's, it's other shit outside of just records and music. So, Scarface is not happy about the Tupac movie. And oh. I think he actually mentioned your name. Mm. He said, well, he mentioned a bunch of people. He said, if MC Breed not in that movie, there ain't no real Pac movie. If the DOC wasn't mentioned in that movie, that's not a real Pac movie. Mm -hmm. If Spice One, Richie Rich, Too Short, Big Psych, and MC8 aren't in it, that's not a real Pac movie. So he refuses to watch it. I talked to him the other day. He hasn't seen it. He's not going to see it. He's not fucking with it. Your name got thrown in here. Mm. Why do you think your name got thrown in? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I knew Pac. I mean, we toured together. We did Menace to Society together. We worked on the film together. But I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't even think to be in the Tupac movie because I don't look for shit like that. You don't have to glorify me by putting me in a movie of a, you know, I don't. I'm a different type of motherfucker, people don't think, you know, so I don't know by saying, be, I, I don't know, maybe he felt like because it, it wasn't original to him, you know, or the originality of the people he knew or the people he associated with, you know, like, because I, I feel him on that when you saying, you know, Breed, because if everybody remember when Poop, Tupac first, you know, him and Breed was like that. Yeah. So people want to see significant parts when you do stories like that. Like, like in, 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 in the Straight Outta Compton movie, there was no J.J. Fad, you know, shit like right. that. People want to see, like, because we were there in the beginning, you know. Even though y'all trying to rush through and show the the, the 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 shootings and the fights and the fucking the the the, the murder and y'all just want to just get to it. I guess some people feel like it it can't be authentic if it's not to the letter of a person's life. And you have to, you know, what some people may feel is not important, you can't tell that to a motherfucker who was there every day. Like, y'all don't mention me at all, but God damn it, I was there for three years every day in Pac's life. You know what I'm saying? We did this and we did that. So it's very touchy when you deal with personal friends and family on shit like this. And especially if you don't put it word for word of how you know the fucking story happened. Because let's face it, it's a movie. You can only squeeze so many minutes, you know what I'm saying, into that fucking hour, two hour, 90 minute program. So people like to, mm, well, yeah, well, let's cut that because really that wasn't nothing. Or let's show this, but let's just show it and get on to the next part right. of, of, of the drama of his life or whatever. So it's not gonna please, it's not gonna appease everybody. We have a very interesting phenomenon that seems to have happened for the first time in all of hip hop history, is you have a slew of people that are now calling themselves the new Tupac. Mm. Where, but let's just take a step back, right? Me, me and you have been doing this forever. Yeah. No one calls themselves the new Biggie. 
No. No one has called themselves the new Run DMC, the new LL Cool J, the new MC8. I've we never heard we, this before. We, didn't, we don't. We don't do shit like that. You though. know, like in in fact, you know what's kind of here's what's kind of interesting. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Snoop, I believe, was the first rapper to redo a rap record with Lottie Dottie. Up until that yeah. point, I believe it was pretty frowned upon to redo someone's record. It was looked at as biting. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you're biting this if you bite, If you did anything what somebody else was doing and you didn't create it, you, you were was a biter. biter. You were a biter. That's it. And that was the term. That was a the biter. term. You was a biter. And, and Snoop, but Snoop did it with enough finesse that people respected it. True. You see what I'm saying? And, and then he did it again, I think, with Vapors. True. Right. And then he pretty much stopped after that. <laughs> he just did uh, The Moment I Feared. Oh, he did? Yes. Okay, I missed that one. That's on the new album. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I missed it. Okay. And there, there is a whole thing in hip-hop of originality and biting and stuff like that. As someone who's worked with Tupac before, mm-hmm. when you first heard, I mean, first it was Troy Ave called, you know, called himself New Pac. Mm-hmm. Then Boosie called himself Boo Pac. Mm-hmm. We broke that story. Uh, my next album, I'm naming it Boo Pac, man. Boo Pac? Yeah. Like Tupac? Boo Pac. People gonna get on you for this. Yeah, I know it's gonna be a big old, it's gonna be a big old thing, but you know, it's in my heart, and you know, that's that's what I want to do. I'm naming it Boo Pop. It's a double disc, 26 songs. Um, because you know, I'm my, I'm my generation, Tupac. And now Young Thug <laughs> says, I dropped my album on the same on Tupac's birthday because I'm the new Tupac. I'm the thug that. Tupac never got to be. And then, you know, you knew this was coming. Why why if Lucci said Tupac never wore a dress? So, MC8, what is your take on all the new Pacs? To be honest, I'm gonna keep it real. I was my first time ever hearing this shit. Uh, oh, you've never heard any of these? Mm-mm. I've never heard anybody calling themselves the the new Pac or I'm Pac or whatever. I just, I don't know if it's because people want to live off his legacy of who he was. And I guess because the motherfuckers feeling like, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm a hard nigga too. But you can be hard in your own right without having to feel like, because I've never had it. I've never had the. I've never had the feeling of wanting to call myself the next Easy. I was gonna say that. Yeah. Or or <laughs> or the next Cube. I've never, you know. And even when I looked up to them niggas when I was trying to rap, and they were the niggas, I never went around and said, "Fuck that. I'm 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 Cold Cube or fucking I'm Fruit Cube or whatever. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Rubik's Cube, whatever the fuck." <laughs> I never felt like, because us over here on the West Coast, you ain't nev- you ain't bigger than the next motherfucker. I don't give a fuck who you are. Everybody your own man. That's how we feel. So, motherfucker, you, you don't call yourself another nigga. We did that in the neighborhood. Like, if I'm eight, that's little eight. Or if that's OG, that's little OG. But, but I didn't, nobody went around like, yeah, I'm eat. I'm I'm eight easy, or you know, yeah. I'm eight cube, or I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah, and you know what you just pointed out, which I didn't think about, was that no one from the West Coast is saying that. We don't do that shit. <laughs> we don't, we don't identify with another man's legacy. Yeah, that's you. You, I have no right to call myself eight Pac nothing because none of my shit is patterned after Tupac. You get me? I don't wear bandanas on my head. I don't walk around shirtless with the thug life tattoo. I don't I don't claim to be a I'm me. So to me that's sort of people who want to 
associate themselves with his legacy. But I just think it's kind of a little awkward because why you want to be somebody else? Be your own man. Make your own fucking foundation because now you feeding off of what he done set by saying, oh, I'm the next Pac. There is none. There, there, there is none. I mean, whether you want to say you pattern your rap style after him or your aggression or your dress or whatever, but that that shit ain't that ain't no man. That's not a man thing. Like like I said, over here we don't do that. We respect each other's own shit. That's what you did. That's what you did. I'm not finna try to come up, and especially if you already there. I mean, people right. already know who Lil Bootsy is. Yeah. People know who Troy Ave is. People know who Young Thug is. So why go? I'm the next. When you should be your own original. When the whole so-called East Coast, West Coast beef was happening, mm -hmm. I don't remember you getting involved in any type I mean, of I mean, fashion. I, don't, I, didn't be, I didn't get into that shit. I had love for New York niggas. Yeah. I mean, Wu-Tang, Nas, I mean, Buster, Tretch. These are niggas I used to fuck with on like just on some real shit. And then Primo and Guru. My man Harry Fobbs, rest in peace. I mean, I fucked with New York cats, so I didn't get into all. Of it. I didn't get it. To me, that was Death Row and Bad Boy. Right. And then, and then a couple of side motherfuckers who felt like I want to get into that too because I feel like my pride of L.A. or my pride of New York yeah. is too. But yeah, Capone and Noriega jumped into it. Right. LA. But, or but, wait, Capone Noriega and. Was it Mob Deep also? He called out Mob Deep. He called, but my thing is, I never, I never got because it ain't no beef. What are we beefing about? What y'all right. niggas rapping and we rapping? We right. two different styles. I respect y'all because y'all started this shit, which is true. But the beef is because of what? Because niggas trying to bang now and niggas want to be harder. We never had that problem before. You know what I'm saying? Back in the er the eras of when I, you know, I went to New York all the time and promo toured and did shows and, and fucked with niggas, Pete Rock and Premier. And I didn't have that, but some niggas wanted that because they wanted to symbolize with, I don't know, we, ha we the hardest coast, we the hardest coast, we the originators, y'all on some gang banging shit. But to me, it was death row and bad boy. That's right, now, that's true. But now that I think about it, a lot of people kind of got swept up in that and went along with it. So, for example, like I'm just thinking off the top of my head, J. Ru the Damager, who right. I was a huge fan of, had an album called uh, one of the, Primo's Boys. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he had an album called "The Sun Rises in the East." When the East is in the house, <laughs> oh my God, danger! Right, which which I felt was, and that came out right at the height of all that shit. And then, like I remember uh, West Side Connection. Ice Cube says something like the the sun rises in the east, but it sets in, in the, the west, west, which I thought was kind of a response to Jay Rue. I didn't look at it like that. I get you but because you it could have been, it could have been a response. But when I listened to the Jay Rue the Damager record and it used to bang, I never got the I never got the inclination of oh he dissing us. You hear him? He nigga when the east is in the house. It, oh, I just looked at hey, it's the the east coast. Fuck it. Of course, because that's why I'm a feel about where I'm from. When Compton is in the house, God damn it, it's danger. I didn't look at it like I'm directing it at them niggas. You could have took it like that. But then, like, at that time, like you said, a lot of people were getting swept up in the tidal wave of the bad boy and death row thing. And because of the beef that was happening, you had certain cats that wanted to represent their coast. West Side Connection did the, you know, the bow down and you, like you said. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and like you said, Capone and Noriega did LA, LA and right. shit. Like, you know, so. People, it, people were fueling it. Was, it. it was a few people that were drawn into it. But to me, it was that small circle of people who wanted that. Because outside of that, I didn't have no beef with Tribe Called Quest or Wu-Tang or EPMD or 
gang star or Nas or you know what I'm saying? The alcoholics didn't have no beef or King T didn't have no beef or right. fucking, you know, Too Short didn't have no beef. And you, it was it was that small circle to where people felt like, you know some. It's like a motherfucker playing double dutch and you standing on the side and a motherfucker going, fuck that, I'm going to jump in too and get my little shit and then I'm going to jump out. Right. Know? That's what I took it as. Niggas want to jump in, say they little two cents, and then everything's peace now. Everything, you know, because nothing really escalated as between, only between death row, bad boy. Yeah, and ultimately the two. The ultimate shit. You yeah. get me? Because all the other shit that motherfuckers was just jumping in and got out, the two motherfucking entities that was really like, fuck y'all, fuck each other, the bad results happened of that. So, you know, you just had two entities, I thought, that just felt like, fuck it. You had two powerhouses, you know what I'm saying? Right. You have that when we have fucking basketball championships, football championships, you get the players get to talking shit about each other and tweeting and saying little shit. And then next thing you know, so I, I just took it as that, you know, if you was a nigga who was in this hip hop game and you had respect as far as, I just had respect for hip hop for, for that bullshit to go down my way. You know what I'm saying? This is something that we've been trying to keep together for a long time and, 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 and to let it go to the fact of now we acting like we two gangs in the neighborhoods and banging and shit. I mean, we could just bang and shit then. Right. Leave music out of it and let's just bang, fuck it. Let's just stop saying it's, it's, it's a East Coast, West Coast beef over music and just say, I don't like you niggas. <laughs> I don't like you niggas, I don't like you niggas, so fuck it. Let's either box or we gonna see each other. With, but let's lead, we, we should cut the music out with it because now it's gonna fuck everybody up. Well, there was a little bit of a resurgence of that when Kendrick had that King of New York line. I, where, I heard where that. People, yeah. Did you ever see the Corrupt interview when no. I asked him about that? No. You call you call yourself the king of New York in a in a previous song, and when he said it, a lot of people didn't realize it. King but that of New was York, a, what is the king of New York? What did corrupt mean? You tell me about king of New York. What, what, what was the whole verse? Hmm, incredible. Hold on, maybe I could look it up. You want mine or Kendrick's? Your verse. I'm important like the Pope. I'm the king of New York. I'm live from South Central. I'm a Muslim on pork. Mm. That means I'm the fucking worst. And that's all it meant. I'm the fucking worst. I'm important like the Pope. I'm important, nigga. I'm the king of New York. His name was Frank White. You notice how since somebody from the West Coast will say they're the king of fucking New York, they automatically assume we're disrespecting New York. Right. I'm sick of that shit. We don't have a problem with you, New York. Stop it, my nigga. King of New York is a fucking movie. Mm. It's a fucking movie. Biggie called himself Frank fucking White. Who is Frank White? Christopher Walken. Wrong. He's the fucking king of New York. It's a fucking movie, man. We don't want your city, your country, your town. We don't want, we from Los Angeles, we from Compton. Nigga, Watts, Inglewood. Nigga, we are the West Coast. Why the fuck? Fuck what we want to be where you at, nigga. We don't like your fucking streets. We like ours, cuz. Ours. We don't have a problem with you guys, my nigga. <laughs> I did see that interview. <laughs> one, of the, one of the greatest Vlad TV interviews of all time. Yeah, I did see that. <laughs> Damn it. You saw it. Yeah, I did see that. Luckily, there was no East Coast, West Coast beef to follow this, follow that line. But, but there was an absolute anger from corrupt over having to gone through that, losing people behind it, 
getting shot at. You know, there was a whole New York, New York video mm-hmm. shoot. And they got yeah, shot they, at. Yeah, they video shot, got shot up. Got shot yeah. up, right. It was, it was a fucking mess. And then, you know, he was cool with Tupac. Mm-hmm. He respected Biggie. Like the whole, the whole thing ended up just getting all fucked up. Um, did you have any idea when, when this was happening that how bad it was gonna get? As far as what the beef? Yeah. Like I said, we've been having rap beefs in hip hop for a long time. Now, when we started our, you know, what y'all want to call gangster rap, reality rap, whatever, it just took on a new persona as far as young niggas from the West Coast feeling they selves, you know, representing their neighborhoods or whatever. I never looked at it as escalating to the point of, you know, drive-by shootings and all that, but you have to understand that niggas niggas mentalities aren't just set on rap music, especially when they come from the fucking streets and gangs or whatever. So, I mean, being a rapper, I kind of took it as like, you know, this is just some, niggas talk shit on records. They've been doing that. But we are a new era of nigga now, you know what I'm saying? And and you got these young cats, like you were saying, like when I first started rapping, I was banging. And that was the first thing, I'm gonna let you know. Yeah, I'm MC8 the rapper, but I'm still banging. So to feel disrespected on a record is like, motherfucker, you want to get into some gang shit. Like, so, going, like I said, niggas was talking shit, everybody was talking shit, everybody doing their thing. Did I think it to the point to where it was going to go to where niggas was going to end up getting killed or whatever, but rap music was all reality. Shit, it, it wasn't changing us, you know what I'm saying? I'm able to make some money now by talking shit to you about where I come from. And now that's gonna make me feel more a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Cause now I got the popularity and the people and whatever, whatever. So now if a nigga diss me on record, it might go further than just another comeback record. It might go to the point of where I'm, we might send niggas to blast on you and shoot on you and shit because we still live in that life. I don't want you to mistake me as just no motherfucking rap nigga. Because that ain't it. Because before rap came along, I was still on the block slanging crack, hanging with thugs, packing straps and all that. So it's your pride that's involved when you get into these rap beefs. Me personally, when I was beefing with a nigga or whatever, yeah, I knew it was a, it, it could have been a chance. Niggas caught me slipping and dumped on me and shot at me, vice versa. But that was the aspect of Nick of of us street niggas in rap. Like I said, you had the LL Cool J beefs, niggas rap clown, whatever, whatever. That's <laughs> it. Right. Other niggas, you know, rap beef. His, it's been going on. But I think it when our time came and the gangster rap thing, and you know, everybody wanting to represent their coast and where they from. And then, like I said. I can't control every nigga that's in my entourage. I might not be finna go do some, but I got three niggas who behind me who really look at it like, nigga, motherfuckers just dissed the neighborhood. They just dissed us on, so fuck that rap shit. Them niggas over here shooting a video, let's go. Them niggas over here performing, let's go. So that's what it came to. Because you had niggas who had been embedded in gangs and street shit and fuck rap, but now rap is involved now because you got all these young niggas up and coming who finding that this is a way for me to be who I be and make some change. So that's why I never tried to get into rap beefs because I knew this shit could ask because this how we living over here. Before I started rapping, you talking shit about a nigga could get your cap peeled. You disrespecting a nigga could get your cap peeled. So now that it's on a broader scale, now you embarrassing me in front of a million niggas instead of just two or three. So now I got to do something about that. Right, and 
you know, I interview a lot of Chicago artists, and the thing to do these days in Chicago is to is to diss the dead homies. Right. That's a thing now, which I know it's always been a thing in gang culture, but you've just never seen it popularized. Look, you know, we're those ch- niggas up there is crazy. Yeah. They they wild up in Chi Town, you know, and it's like I said, it's a lot of. It's so accessible now. You know what I'm saying? Fuck, nigga, I go home in my fucking bathroom with a microphone and a computer, and I, who gonna stop me? Now I'm finna diss all your niggas that just got shot. I'm gonna talk about how I'm finna come shoot you, shoot your mama, shoot your kids, and I'm finna put it out in the street on a video. That shit, it, it, it escalates because n- y'all niggas ain't rapping. Y'all banging and shit with music, you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. you're calling me out, you're talking about you're going to shoot me. No nigga looks at that as rap record. Nigga look at that like this nigga beefing, talking shit. So that's when it escalates because niggas forget that our thing is music. This is a music in a way of our expression to motherfuckers of what we have been through or what we see or whatever. But when you got niggas who t- trying to prove they worth, and try and get that identity, you know what I'm saying? I might be little nobody, but let me go over here and talk about nigga your two homeboys that got killed last night and make a video and put it up on YouTube and won't you? Nigga, I got a million views tomorrow. You get me? And that is and and I'm looked at as oh yeah, man. Man, did you see that? That nigga got the AK with him. He talking about nigga, I come over there and, sh- and that's what it's about now. If you look at fucking rap and these little clicks and all that shit, that's all it's about now. Nigga, I'm gonna stand here at the house in front of the niggas with my shirt off with a gang of niggas and show y'all how many guns we got and whatever. That ain't rap music. Them niggas just beefing on wax. That's banging on wax. That's real banging on wax. Real banging on wax, right? And you're talking about there's an album that came out back in the day right. called Banging on That's Wax. That's real banging on wax. Yeah, man, it's sad. I don't, you know, I interview a lot of these dudes and I try to you know, I, I try to show the downside of all that. The the reality of all that and how how fucked up it is and how to them that's popularized though. Yeah. That makes me more popular. When I go, you know what I'm saying? Cause shit, nigga, motherfucker come smoke me today, nigga. Motherfucker, you know what I'm saying? It's popularized now by niggas getting on videos, saying I'm a smoker, nigga, and whatever, whatever. It's not rap beef. You're banging on whack. Right. But can't you say that you were doing the same thing with Quick at one point? Mm, yeah. Because I was representing my neighborhood, he was representing his neighborhood, right. I was a crip, he was a blood, yeah. and that's where it stemmed from. Our shit didn't stem from music, though. Our right. shit stemmed from straight up gang banging. Which, is, the, which is what the, the Chicago shit right. is based our, on. Our shit was, our shit, but see, I didn't start out as a rapper to have beefs with, neighbor, with DJ Quicks and all them type of niggas. Niggas already knew we was banging. Niggas already knew he was a blood, I was a crip. So I didn't do that to glorify me being a crip or a gangbanger. I did that because that's what we did when you beef with the other set. And at the time, I just happened to be a fucking rapper. You know what I'm saying? If I wasn't a rapper and was just a normal nigga, I'd probably be trying to strap up every night and go pull drive-bys. But because I'm a rapper, then yeah, I got to represent the neighborhood and let a nigga know, especially if I'm being dissed by a nigga from a rival set. When you were rapping originally, I don't, you know, I assume you had like the, the arm tattoos, but you didn't have the face tattoo. No. When did the face tattoo come around? I got this face tattoo maybe about eight years ago. Okay. And it's praying hands? Yes. Why? Mm. I put the praying hands on my face because I looked at it as the protection I had been given in this music business. I've been through a lot. You know, I done been in beefs. I done been in legal battles, money battles. I done been in fucking, you know, fucking gang affiliation shit. I done been through a lot of shit. So I put the praying hands on me because 
I didn't want to symbolize it as, you know, everybody get the tattoo tears because they've been to prison and did all that shit. I wanted to make it something that symbolized a, a positive nature, even though it was a tattoo. And for something that I've been through and my struggles is why I put it on my face. I feel you. Well, here's my last question, and it kind of ties into what you just said. You're 50 years old right now. No. You're not 50 years no. old? No. Okay. Well, Wikipedia got it wrong then. Yeah. Wikipedia is wrong. <laughs> I'm only 46. Okay. You're 46 years old. Yeah. Which doesn't really change my question. There, there was a book that I read recently uh, that basically laid out that regardless of how things are popularized in culture, the world as a whole is becoming less and less violent. When you look at a thousand years ago, you look at 500 years ago, you look at 100,000 years ago, and you look at what people went through and the level of violence associated mm -hmm. with society. Uh, true. You, you, you read the old, you know, the Bible. The medieval and times and medieval all that crazy times, shit. Yeah, yeah, where people yeah. were getting put on, yeah. you know, oh, on yeah. wheels. Staked and, up and all that type of yeah. shit. Yeah. Like, not only people were getting killed, but they were finding innovative ways to torture people and, and stuff like that. If you look at the last 30 years of your life, from you being a teenager mm -hmm. to you being 46 right now, do you feel that America has gotten less violent, more violent, or is about the same? It all depends on the way you look at it. War is always going to happen. Yeah. You get me? So set aside that. You look on the news, fucking... Motherfucker killed a baby. Motherfucker killed a, you know, fucking raped a kid. Motherfucking, so has that been going on since forever? Yeah. Um, from where I come from, if I put it in my perspective of how I look at the world, I can say that from the era of me growing up, mm -hmm. maybe slightly, Niggas are still getting shot and killed. Okay, so if you let, let's just look at just Compton. But if I wanted to say from the time I was fucking seven to now, knowing all the gang shit and whatnot, I think from the time I was born to fifteen, the streets of Compton was hella fired. Now, will I say they like that from back then? I don't. I don't what you say? I wouldn't think so. Not at all, not at all. We don't have the, like I said, it's still the gang violence and it's still whatever, but from what I see, it, it, ain't, it ain't like it was when I was fucking 12, 11. Niggas was getting shot, killed every night. Two and three motherfuckers, like, like clockwork. Can you turn on the news right now and go, there's been three, four drive-by shootings in Compton today and yesterday? And the day before, maybe not. Can you look up and see that our city has rejuvenated from the riots and all that shit? We got Best Buys and fucking Fridays and Starbucks and shit that 30 years ago, you'd have been like, hell no. <laughs> no fucking way. <laughs> so back then there was no such thing as a, as a chain oh, store hell no. in Compton. Hell no. Well, we had what, Boys Market? But them motherfuckers left. <laughs> Everything left. Boys Market left. Newberry's left. <laughs> fucking Woolworth left. Wow. All them stores, they booked yeah. the hell up. A Sizzler. Everything left. Because Compton was a fucking war zone. And when I say war zone, I mean every night. Somebody from somebody hood was getting killed. Is it like that now? No. Because like I said, a gang of niggas is like us. You know, we 40, 50 years old. The youngsters, they on some different shit now. Back then, we was just purists. Neighborhood, fuck it, it's about the block. Now, nowadays, you can't tell a motherfucker from shit. So I think it's different now that it's not so violent, but it's still fucking problems. It, it's still problems. 
is is it to the point where motherfuckers is getting hung by trees and shit like that? No, but it's still fucked up. You still got race shit. You still got Mexican and black shit. You still got niggas in inner city with they beefs and they long standing, you know, your nigga killed my brother 30 years ago. So that will never let die. But can I say like niggas is doing you know, every Sunday you could go to Compton, to Louis Burgers and, and, and Tam's Burgers and see the whole city with low riders and everybody in the same parking lot. Yeah. You see that now. You couldn't see that back in the days. That wasn't happening. So it's, it, 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 it's all in how you look at it and your perspective. For me, it's calmed down a lot. To some other people who's outside looking in, Compton might be the same old motherfucker it used to be from back then and days. But from us being there and from me seeing the progress, I don't think it is as violent. Because us as teenagers, motherfucker, you couldn't go, you couldn't walk, you couldn't ride your bike, you couldn't stand on the corner without a motherfucker coming to hit you. So I think that I think the times have changed and eased up a little bit and made it a little accessible for people to find other opportunities. Yeah. Well, because Dre just he's going to be donating a ten million dollar performing arts center. Right. I mean, we need uh, we, we need shit like that. I mean, because Compton we don't have shit like that in Compton. I mean, you know, like I said, they're trying to beautify it by bringing in all these big corporations and these big stores, but ain't still ain't shit going on for the youth. Yeah, but it sounds like things are improving based on what you're saying. We're, we're trying, and that's all you can hope for. You know, you get people who wants to uplift the city and wants to see it do positive, like Kendrick got the key to the city from the mayor and stuff right. like that, you know. We just, you know, like I said, for Compton, we all been doing this shit all our lives, trying to uplift the city and make people see what we see, how we've grown up and what we've been through. And that's just it in the bottom line. That's what it is. Gio. MC8, always a pleasure, man. Gio.